Hello, welcome back to the podcast. In this panel discussion, I'm speaking with various tech and recruitment experts about CV tips, about interview advice and hiring recommendations. We're discussing how you can land your next opportunity and how your company can secure the best talent on the market. Also, make sure you stick around to the end of this podcast because we'll be sharing top tips on how you can stand out both as an employee and an employer. All of this and more in this episode of the podcast. The Alfie Wattam Podcast. Awesome. So let, let's start with CV tips. A lot of people that watch this show, they're software developers, they work in tech, and they're maybe looking for the next opportunity, or they're always open to opportunities, and they don't really know what it takes to, to write a killer CV, you know, one that's going to get people's attention. I always say that the point of a CV is to get an interview, and people often can't get interviews because they can't get the CV right. You've all looked at hundreds, if not thousands of, of CVs probably in, in, in your careers um, as software developers, front end, back end, full stack and other type, types of uh, tech roles as well. Um, we'd be keen to get your, um, we'll start with like what looks like a good CV to you, I suppose. And you know, what, what sort of things stick out to you as appealing, interesting when you see that you're like, yeah, I'd love to interview that person. Um, Adam, do you want to kick, kick us off? What's, wow. what, what makes a good CV to, to you? Mate? <sighs> it's, it's always difficult. I think if we're talking about sort of tech in general, um, people always say, oh, like tenure in jobs. Mm. Um, and if people have got a good, if someone's jumped from three months here, three months there, I suppose I used to do contract recruitment, so um, that doesn't put me off, but it will put hiring managers off. So obviously we need to have, that, need to have those conversations with them and explain that to them. But I think generally if someone's had good tenures in places and not jumped around um, is generally a good thing unless they've been contracting. Do you know the, the, the problem with um, a lot of CVs is they've been contracting and they don't even mention it. Yeah. So you, you'll see a CV and it just says three months here, six months here, and like 90% of people would just reject it. When in yeah. reality, they're a great candidate. They want to go perm now, but they um, you know, just haven't mentioned the word contract on their CV, right? 100%. And I think it's just... And it's laying those out. And sometimes, actually, if you've done loads of stints in different places, cause, I mean, generally, people will always combat with, well, if they're any good, they would have stayed there for longer. But sometimes it might just be a three-month job where it's a short project and, and that sort of thing. I think sometimes maybe condense them all into one, as in contracting. Yeah. And these are the sorts, maybe these are the companies I worked at and these are some of the, the projects that I worked on, basically. Um it's always difficult to say, like, th- these are good. I think it's easier to say bad things about CVs rather than rather yeah. than good we'll, things. We'll, we'll go to red flags, I yeah. suppose, in a second. But that, that's a good <laughs> one to get started. So, you know, good, good tenure or, you know, at least explaining why the yeah. roles have been shorter if they've been contracts or, or something like that. Um, what, what about yourself, Craig? What's, um, what's good on a CV when you look at resumes? Um, I like to see tangible outcomes. Mm-hmm. So when so we're talking about technology CVs, so... When a candidate says, did this, did that, worked with this, it's quite generic um, and it's difficult to set apart people who have you know, done more or have de- deeper knowledge yeah. in certain areas when the CV speaks the same. Whereas if someone can talk about tangible outcomes like um, saying that an automation they built reduced uh, deployment time from six hours to 30 minutes. Mm. Um, those kinds of things will set you apart. Yeah, You also need to be able to back that up in an interview <laughs> and talk about that succinctly. But those kinds of things will, um, they jump out to me. Um, because you get a lot of CVs that have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of tech just mm. written on them. Yeah, And I think sometimes candidates think that it's a CV kind of, keyword contest Mm. but it's not Um, it's talk about what you did and trust that the recruiters at the other end and the reviewers at the other end understand enough of what they're talking about to be able to see through that you haven't written AWS on your CV 30 times and you've only written it twice yeah Um, because we want (coughs) to know what you're doing rather than or what what you've impacted rather than just what you were part of yeah, I mean, keyword tech stuffing um, 10 years ago was good to get past algorithms and filters. Now it's, you know, a little bit more advanced than that. And it's more about telling a story, like, like you say. I often say that bullet points 
can often equal bragging points in, in a humble way. Um, oftentimes people will just list, you know, if you're a software developer, I write code, I gather user requirements, I deliver. And, and like if you're an engineering manager reading that, you, you know that's what they do as a software mm-hmm. developer. So it's just wasted space. And the average CV is only looked at for like 10 seconds. So if that's how you're going to be selling yourself in those 10 seconds, it's not that appealing. So trying to have specific, I like the idea of numbers, metrics, you know, examples, um, you know, actual tangible achievements. So yeah, I think that's really, really good i think combined those two, like, two ideas i think like 50 percent of cvs would, would go from like a c to a b um yeah. immediately and um, all right well, what about yourself um steve on the i suppose more technical side you know you're, you're not a recruiter you're a, a software engineering leader um what what appeals to you when you look at resumes 100 percent agree with what you just said so um to give you guys some context of like what goes through a hiring manager's mind uh, and especially in smaller companies like 500 and people and less if I've gone through the effort of like opening a vacancy, there's a very specific reason I've done that. Yeah. Uh, I've either spotted a skills gap in my team or I know that I've got a growth strategy over the next year and, and I need to bring in certain skills and abilities and whatnot. And I'll put those details in the job spec that I post up on LinkedIn or wherever you go to get your job specs. And I want to know that people who are coming into the company will help me deliver this vision. Mm. Uh, they will not come in and be a total liability or they're not going to come in just because, as you said, they played uh, keyword bingo with uh, with technologies. It's like, I did Java this one time in 2007. Um, so, so that's something really important to bear in mind, right? And so coming back to your point, it's all about demonstrating impact. And, and I had this experience myself personally. So I, I worked at one company for a very, very long time. 12 years and I I was just completely out of out of the practice of applying for jobs and I put my CV out there and it was just you know keyword bingo and it just got rejected a thousand times and I had to really refine this and eventually what I landed on was exactly the kind of examples you talked about like I implemented this project that took uh, you know that increased profitability by X amount this was what I did in there and over Mm. time like I I started uh, so my CV is very little actual names of words and word bingo and it was like every job that I've got listed on there is about like the 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 achievement at the end of it and so this is kind of when i read someone's cv this is what i'm looking for is like i know what my strategy needs to be over the next year so i knew i need to know that this person that's going to come in has executed that before or they've got the tenacity or in some way they can demonstrate they've got a learning uh, they've got desire to learn Mm. and so this is what i'm looking for i'm looking for them demonstrating that they've had impact at their last role ideally quantified with numbers if you're at a i get it if you're like a junior or mid dev you may not be able to do that but like at a senior dev (coughs) level you may be able to talk about projects that you led and that kind of thing and that's what starts getting my interest um on the flip side of this like some of the some really poor examples i see are uh, sometimes people just like print out their linkedin oh yeah and and there's like no details it's just like i worked at i don't know barclays (laughs) bank and i did code and you're just like and they're I, all the same format because they're auto-generated, so you, <laughs> yeah. you can tell when they're... And it, it often shows if, if they're paying that little attention to detail when it comes to writing a CV, mm. then what are they going to be like in the in the job a lot of the time? Oftentimes, it's a good indicator, right? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I I feel like interviewing and CV writing and all of this is like a whole separate skill set to the job that you actually do, which is unfortunate. It's like you have to play this different game just to get onto the team. Um, it's it's an unfortunate way of the world, but it exists for a reason. So I guess this is why it's important for anyone who's interviewing to understand the context of like what that hiring manager is looking for, yeah. what the company needs to achieve, uh, these sorts of things, how your CV is going to be perceived by another hiring manager, etc. So like it's not just about things like beautiful formatting, which none of us have mentioned, but it is <laughs> sure, important. Sure, sure. Like you know yeah, your yeah. Comic Sans MS like five page, yeah. <laughs> red definitely font. a red flag. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I, I think as well that you, like you guys were saying. I think keywords mm. aren't. I think they get a bad rep because I think they are quite they are quite key on a CV for because I think a lot of the time when you, if you're a software developer you're applying for a job at a big company, it's going to hit a talent acquisition team the majority of the time first, yeah. and the majority of these talent acquisition guys may not have worked in tech before or are not technical. I'm, I recruit for tech, but I'm not technical. I couldn't yeah. code anything, um, so. I think it's still important because a lot of people will control F 
Mm. So if if you have a skill, at least have it on your CV because yeah. people because hiring managers will say, well, you as a recruiter, you'll say, right, what are the key things you're looking for? Mm. They'll give a list of them and maybe the t- technologies and things. And the first thing a lot of people do, Control F, have they got X Y Z on their CV? If they haven't, bin them off. <laughs> or, or, or they've got JS instead of JavaScript, or Ang instead of Angular, or, or, or TS instead of TypeScript, or something, right? And and it seems silly when yeah. you're writing that, but if you look at it from the other person's perspective, um, if they're not going to find that on Control F, you're going in the yeah. deleted folder. I was just say with CVs, you've got to just make things obvious. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Don't don't leave it down to an assumption just because you think people might know what you're talking about mm. they might not and then and, and it's, and even from company to company companies will call things different things the same thing are very different things sure. so yeah. um just try and be as obvious as you can okay agree um always recommend putting the core tech stack that you've worked yeah. with in a role and the core tech stack not not something that you've used you know like for, for an hour <laughs> yeah yeah like like 10 years ago you know like what is your key 10 technologies yeah and and that's the point adam's picking up on there is do include what you've worked with but don't list everything you have either touched or indirectly touched yeah. in that role so if you spent five minutes in a three-year window working with something you probably are not going to be able to answer questions about it in the interview so don't put it on your core tech stack yeah. um, stick the things that you're comfortable knowing and you're comfortable talking about, and you feel confident on, but yes, do include the keywords still. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, this podcast is brought to you by WeLoveAlpha.com. If you're looking to grow and hire and scale your software engineering team in the UK, then go to WeLoveAlpha.com to hire the best software developers on the market. Everything across Java to C Sharp to PHP to Python to React and Angular and mobile and more. Go to welovealpha.com to hire the best software engineers in the UK now. So let, let's say people listening have followed this advice. They've now got really good CVs, okay? And they're starting to see their CV to interview ratio get higher. They're applying for jobs, they're getting more interviews. Okay, wicked. All right, let's 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 talk about how they can ace that interview and get the job, okay? We'll look at it from both the candidate's perspective and then the hiring manager's point of view as well. But we'll start with the um, the candidate, the, the person job searching. Um, once again, we'll, we'll just go around. Um, what would kind of be your, your biggest advice on interviewing? You know, you've all been involved in doing interviews and scheduling them. You see what works, what doesn't work, what common mistakes people make. Um, what are they? What advice would you give? What recommendations, insights? Um, we'll do the reverse order this time. So, so Steve, what, what's your um, good things, pet peeves? <coughs> what's your view on, on interviews? Yeah, it's... So interviewing is, is like a really weird um, speed dating type game in a way yeah, sometimes. And, and, and I think something I would like to say to candidates out there is... Not every rejection was your fault. Um, I, th- I know, and especially when like the market is tight, like you can be rejected a lot. And like, what, what's wrong with me? And sometimes it, it actually isn't you. It's like you, you, you're facing someone who's doing their second ever interview and they are not tight with it yet. Yeah. So don't feel down on yourself, I think, is like the first thing I really want to say to, to candidates out there, um, especially in a tight market. <clears throat> now, the second thing I would say is something I find beneficial is going through... As as someone having done rounds of interviews and uh, as in being the candidate in the last yeah. few years, yeah. going through the company's uh, website, have a quick squeeze through the tech blog if there is one, just trying to understand what they're trying to build, what their vibe is. Like, are they trying to be small and scrappy, trying to build things quickly? Because then I can think of examples from my past that I'll bring up in the interviews. Uh, or are they like large and established and they're looking for like process and procedure? Then I'll bring up those examples from my past experience you need to tailor your answers to where the company is at and mm. what they need to do because again like as i just said like this vacancy exists because a hiring manager such as myself has like a strategy that they need to execute so you as a candidate are coming in to help them execute that and in their mind they're like how is this person going to get in line with my vision or help me grow or push my team forward etc sure. yeah. um th- those are the three big things something i would also recommend i've i've had good experiences with this on the whole is sometimes you can apply to a company directly like through linkedin whatever and then you're kind of on your own you're not really sure what their internal values are or what they're looking for in in the interview but mm-hmm. when you go through an external rec- external recruiting company not even the internal talent acquisition team yeah, yeah. 
they're incentivized uh, to get you that job. Oh, so, yeah. so to anyone listening to this, like commission is usually like with like twenty five percent of the first year salary, something yeah, like that. Fifteen uh, to twenty five, yeah, depending on s- volume and negotiation. Yeah. So the reason I say this is like an external recruiter is very incentivized to get you this job, mm-hmm. and and even then that payout only comes like at the end of the probation period or something. So yeah, yeah. They're incentivized to find the right person and put them in that role and get them to succeed through that probation period. Yes. So to that end, what they're likely to do is send you like info packs, prep packs. Uh, so so the last the last interviews I did was when I joined Multiverse. <laughs> <laughs> and that was about uh, I think I interviewed for them in like August last year, and uh, and I went through an external company, and uh, they sent me all this reading material on like uh, the internal values, what kind of characteristics they're looking for in candidates, and that kind of thing. Cool. And I went through it, and I was like, oh, there's certain things here that I'm not lacking, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't have talked about if I didn't know you were looking for it. So I was able to just pull up relevant examples or yeah. highlight certain aspects of relevant examples, and that helped me get through the door. And and I have found like, you know, at the same time I was at Multiverse because in you different processes and some of them it's a crapshoot like you mm. get in you don't and 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 then they'll come back with feedback say oh but you didn't demonstrate this and i was like i didn't demonstrate because i didn't know you were looking for that sure. so i guess m- my advice would be um and you guys are gonna love this <laughs> go, go through an external recruiter <laughs> if you can uh and then push them to to give you that kind of information like the prep packs and and some recruiters will even like maybe give you feedback on why others failed mm. their interview process and that's kind of something you can review and look look on and just be like okay they didn't demonstrate this or that yeah. and and think of the real examples because as you said like you, they, you're going to get questioned and if, if you didn't really do the thing you said you did it'll come out it, it will come out uh-huh. what, what it comes down to what you're saying really is just, it's just like research right like, like, like going the extra mile with it and, and not just doing it yourself but asking others for information and insights as well that, that can help you on uh, throughout the process because if you've got one candidate and they um, they apply to a job on LinkedIn or Indeed and they get an interview and they just go in and wing it right or you've got another candidate who you know does research on the blog and ha- highlights examples in their past and finds um, colleagues on LinkedIn you might have worked together in the past that you can name drop and and see that they like football and you can mention that you you know how did you join the game last night Ooh, you know that's a that's a tricky territory that one what, football yeah. Well, oh, try, tr- trying to find uh, common ground with uh, with your sure. interview because then that could be perceived as bias. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I get what you're saying, but yeah. I, I guess anything that you can do to stand out from the competition in terms of research, and I, I think, yeah. but, but more more relevant about the job, you know, the, the personal stuff is is a cherry on top sometimes, but. Um, it, you know, relevant information that connects to the position is, is useful. And like you say, recruiters are often the best source of getting that because they have recruited for the company before, they understand the values, they understand what, what works, what doesn't work, and they can of- often give you that information better, better mm. than almost anybody. And um, w- what's your side of the um, the equation, Greg? What, what, what do you see as important for candidates when going for interviews, mate? Yeah, so, I mean, we've touched on the general concept of being prepared. Yeah. So... The first point, um, emphasising a lot of stuff that Stephen said there was um, do your research, look into the company, um, look into the interviewers if you can. Like mm. You're you're normally going to be able to find a LinkedIn profile. Um, you might be able to see, for example, blogs they've written. Um, I generally suggest steering away from personal topics, uh, but when it's work-related, work you might even see mutual companies that you've worked at or similar technologies that you've worked with, be able to talk about certain projects. So a personal touch, yeah. but still focused on the actual role and being prepared for the actual role itself. So that's one. Uh, two, ask questions. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So this is throughout the process, not just in the specific interview. So... Um, Internal recruiters, like external recruiters, should prepare you for your interviews. They should be able to give you a baseline of expectations, what you're going to be asked in the interview, um, a a range of other things. But it's a two-way street. It's an opportunity for you in the interview to ask questions to the interviewers. Mm. Um, One, that can help you find out if the role is good for you, but also it can unearth uh, additional insight for you. um, And then... When you've unearthed that additional insight, you might be able to provide examples, uh, provide them information that makes them think, oh, actually, I hadn't asked that because I hadn't thought about that. Um, And 
that that could help you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, it goes back to the point that interviewers aren't perfect. I think everyone assumes when you're a candidate that you go into an interview that the interviewers, the interview process is absolutely perfect. Mm, mm. But the reality is, is, say you're in an interview for an hour, you've got one hour to show a perception of yourself or show a certain set of skills from yourself. Mm. No interview is perfect where you're going to be able to do that. Sometimes things might get missed. Yeah. And then, yeah. So going back to what Stephen said, it's not always your fault mm. that an interview didn't go well. It's just it didn't align on that day. But unfortunately, the interviewers only have that time frame to be able to judge you. They can't judge you on anything else because that's time to spend with you. So making sure you make the most of it and asking questions as well as being prepared for their questions. And there's so many questions to ask. I mean, surely you'll want to know about the, the roadmap and the tech and the projects and the progression and why, why you enjoy working there. You know, what, 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 you, what don't you like about working there? And the more intelligent questions that you can ask, the, your, your value as a candidate will just instantly skyrocket because it shows you're intelligent, it shows you're inquisitive, it shows you're curious, and it shows that you, that you give a damn as well. Yeah, um, 100%. Okay, well, what's your um, point of view on, on interviews, Adam? Uh, two of them are being covered off already, which is unfortunate. Um, but I think, yeah, like in terms of doing your research, since I've started recruiting in tech and I've been doing it at Metrobank for nearly two years now, it's scary mm. how many people I speak to who know nothing. Mm. About, and I can't even be uh, bothered to look at the website for five minutes before for I have a phone call with them just to see they're all about what, what's the, maybe some of their core values what and our website is so obvious what we what who we are and what we do it's it's I mean, not it's, hard it's in the name bank right? it, well exactly <laughs> and it, and it oh i want to get it why 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 metro bank what, what interests you oh i just want to get into financial services it's like well come on um so i think <laughs> and i think that some summarizes down to enthusiasm i think in, in interviews enthusiasm goes a long way um, and if you can show that you, you're interested in the company and this is why I'm interested and this is the research I've done and then and then with questions, try and stay away from the typical off-the-shelf questions. Try and think outside the box. Um, and, and, and I know it, it's always good to ask about progression and, and, and those sorts of things. Um, but yeah, more around projects they're working on, what's the vision for the next five years and, and, and those sorts of things rather than wasting a question on what's the next steps. Because... Mm -hmm. The next steps, are, well, well, obviously, they're, they're going to come back to you at some point. Um, but I think one of the biggest feedbacks I get from people failing interviews is because they say we rather than I. Oh, yeah. Um, and that is one of the, the, the of the three things that we've we've talked about there. That, that's probably the main one is that we did this, we did that. It's They're not interested in what the team did. They're interested in what you contributed to that team. Yeah. So you can still talk about well, overall we were looking to do this, but within that, I did this and I did that, yeah. um, and that's where your, your tangible, tangible examples come from that you're on, on your on your CV and, and things like that. So that's generally the it's either there was no enthusiasm there or yeah. they just talked about what what the team did and we couldn't. And even when you've given people feedback to say, look, you, you said we too much. Next interview, you really need to focus on what you did in that project. Mm. And then people still can't do it. It's just, uh, yeah. You're not hiring a team, are you? You're, you're hiring the individual. And I see this on CVs as well. It's always about the team did this, the team did that. No. That oftentimes is a red flag for them hiding behind the achievements of others and, and not talking about what they specifically achieved as well. So I, I like what you said around questions that reflect on the, um, the background of... Um, the research that have been done because you mentioned earlier about about the blogs and that's a really good point so instead of asking hey what are the next steps you know a better question would be hey i saw that you just landed this huge project with company x C you know tell me about that that it shows that you've done the research and it shows that you're, that you're smart and willing to ask those types of questions right yeah. um what are you gonna say Steve? i you know i have such mixed feelings about this whole thing about um showing enthusiasm in a job and and i believe there's a diversity and inclusion angle to this right okay um at <sighs> At a certain level in a company, you start to assume that everyone should be interested in your company and everything. And you forget, like, a lot of people come from backgrounds where it's just like, I need a paycheck. Yeah, sure. Right? And I'm willing to do the grift. Like, I'm willing to to, to do the work. You tell me what I need to do. I'm willing to do the work. But I genuinely, I, I do not care what your company is, right? I'm mm. just here to get a paycheck. And I, I feel like at, at a certain level, uh, we, we forget that. We lose that sight. And 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 th and there's a diversity and inclusion angle to this. I genuinely believe, right? And and I, 
as and and I know it's 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 almost given as accepted now in the industry that you have to turn up to an interview showing a lot of interest and enthusiasm about the company and it's like oh, I, I need to eat and pay my rent. Sure. Um yeah, yeah. so I, I just want to acknowledge that for like anyone listening to this podcast guy, oh my god, a bunch of people who just <laughs> want me to be interested in them. Like I, I really do want to acknowledge yeah. that. I, and I think the key word here is co- comes keeps coming back to enthusiasm. I can't, like I think most of us have used that word at this point, right? Because yeah. the hiring manager wants to know that you're going to come in fired up to deliver and make their lives easier, push the team forward, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the key thing that you want to get across. So, you know, it is a necessary evil that you do like a five minute job looking into the company, yeah. looking into their blog posts, whatever it is, mm. just to see how you can demonstrate that you will help them move forward. Um, yeah. I just wanted to put that out. Yeah, no, and, no, and, and I don't true. see it, sometimes I don't see it like, because I see, I see things on LinkedIn, like recruiters going, oh, like hiring managers or, or internal recruiters, stop thinking that your company's the best thing since sliced bread and everyone yeah. wants to come and work for you exactly. and everyone should be honoured to work for you. I don't see it like that. Uh, part of me does, but the way I see it is if they if they can't be bothered to do a little bit of research prior to the interview, what are they going to be like when they actually get here? Yeah, that, exactly. That's the, that, yeah. that's the angle that I... That's the angle that I... I'm not um, thinking that Metrobank is like the best thing in the world and everyone should, is gagging to go work for us and mm. be, like obviously you just we've got loads of people applying and we're the best best thing in the world it's more so just that can this person that we were interviewing to have that baseline to just go out of their way and spend it doesn't take that long to research a company but can they prep sure for an interview and come do this because if, if they're not going to do that what are they actually going to be like when they get into the role mm. and i think that's where where i see it coming from so so definitely it helps to like maybe make your you as a candidate make your research relevant. So maybe you look into the blogs and you go, okay, well, this is the tech they're working with. These are the kind of things they've experimented with recently. This is what I'm interested in. Maybe I'm not so interested in, as a company, we've just acquired this other company. But what I am interested in is like the micro stuff. So find something where you can, as a candidate, find something where you can be enthusiastic and you can come in and be like, hey, you know, this was really interesting to me. Where are you you going with this? Uh, Where do you want to take this technology? Yeah, like real curiosity is, is yeah. obvious people can tell when you're faking that sort of thing yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's a good point i think some people have an assumption that enthusiasm also equals high energy in an sure. interview mm. um, and i don't agree with that mm. i think that one thing i want to highlight to candidates out, candidates out there is that um just because we're saying show some enthusiasm as you say that can that word can also be curiosity yeah. yeah um yeah. it doesn't mean you need to go into the interview and be this super high energy person yeah and that's also advice that you should be given to hiring managers in yeah. interviews is that don't expect people not don't expect every personality type yeah to come into the room interviewers shouldn't expect every candidate that comes in and sits in an interview to be high energy yeah. as as a way of showing enthusiasm. Yeah. There are lots yeah. of other ways to show enthusiasm. And I've had multiple cases in the past uh, where I've had to work with hiring managers on those kinds of concepts that going, oh, but they didn't show enthusiasm. Okay, why? Oh, well, you know, they didn't seem like super enthusiastic and high energy in the interview. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, yeah. I understand that, but there are other ways to show yeah. that level of enthusiasm. Yeah, high energy, oftentimes, even the tech world, even it often isn't the answer because a lot of people are introverted, right? Yeah. I mean, from a sales perspective, you almost want to match and mirror their, their body language and tone and behaviour to, to really, if you want to be effective at that sort of thing. But I think it just comes down to like giving a damn. Like You can tell if somebody yeah. is care, cares on or not. And if you if you care and, and if you show that, then that that's what we mean by enthusiasm, right? That's yeah. what we mean by energy. So it's just you know giving a damn about it. Hi there, just dropping you a message to let you know that I would love to give you a free copy of my brand new salary guide for UK software engineers. If you're a software developer watching this, then you can use this report to finally see if you're being paid what you're worth. Or if you're a technology leader, you can use this data to make sure that your team is being compensated fairly. All of this info is completely free, but for a limited time only. So make sure that you download it now. Just scan the QR code on the screen right now to get your free PDF copy or go to welovealpha.com forward slash salary guide to access the data now. Yeah. Um, all right, f- flip side. So 
solid advice there for candidates with CVs, with interviews. Let, let's, you know, for the next 20 minutes, flip it over to the other side of the coin. Hiring managers, you know, um, and, you know, even internal recruiters that are involved in the decision making process in terms of who gets through the first round or the second round or whatever, or oftentimes, you know, the final check before somebody gets the job. Um, so when you're interviewing candidates for a position, um, what, um, what's important for hiring managers to do to get the candidate interested? Because it's not just a two-way, a one-way streak. It's not just about evaluating the candidate. It's a job, um, the candidate short market, right? Oftentimes I'll get a requirement from a hiring company and they, they need to find X, Y, and Z. And so niche. So they, it's more about them selling the candidate on the opportunity rather than the other way around. So um, how can hiring managers uh, increase their offer to closing ratio how can they get more people interested and excited and wanting to work for them what what's important for hiring managers when it comes to interviewing um craig we'll, we'll start with yourself we'll mix it up okay um couple of points one just like candidates interviewers need to be prepared when they go into interviews um look at the cv not two minutes before you go into the interview um have a look have a read through design the questions, not the questions themselves, but the, the criteria should be defined well before 15 minutes before you go into an interview. Yeah. But the idea is, is design questions that are going to be able to uh, assess those criteria or competencies you're looking for, but by personalising the questions a little bit more. Yeah. So rather than just going, tell me an example of this, go, oh, I saw that you have delivered this. Can you talk me through how that, um, impacted X or Y mm. and give us a run through about why you chose to do it in that particular way. Yeah. Um, and first of all, that shows that you've done your research. It gives them a minute. Um, secondly, um, one of the big things, uh, be transparent about what the role is. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, man. Yeah, that so saves so many headaches, right? Yeah. Hiring managers sometimes wonder why a process doesn't work out once the candidate's been in the job for three months. And then sometimes that goes back to, well, you told them the role was different to what it was. So I know people want to fill the vacancy, but to get the right candidate, be transparent with the candidate with what the role is, mm. what they're going to be doing, why the role is open, what what the expectations are, and what they can expect from you. So i.e. as a company, what they're going to get back. And if you're honest about it, you'll be surprised how refreshed candidates find that. Um, tell them what the challenges are. Be open about that. And as much as you want to sell your company, selling transparency is going to be a massive help for you. Yeah. So when you're speaking to candidates and interviewing candidates, be honest about the process, be prepared, and be upfront about really what the role is and what impact they're going to be able to have in the role that they're going to be doing. If you just talk about the good, it's obvious that they're hiding something, right? Not every <laughs> not every job's perfect, right? You have to you have to go, hey, full transparency, here's some areas that, that you know, are going to be a challenge and they're going to be hard work and, you know, they're going to be uh, a priority for you to try and fix, you know, and, and people will respect that, they'll appreciate it and they'll be more likely to accept the job knowing what they're getting into rather than just being painted a a lovely story and then three months later it's like what the what the hell is this you know mm. they often also thrive in that situation yeah you know, when there's certain challenges to be overcome if you've got a candidate who knows that and they thrive under that then they're going to be interested by the job yeah if you set a job that's all you know oh this is perfect you're just going to have to do this and this that might not be interesting to them mm. some of them some people are looking for those difficult challenges so actually selling the role how it is one is going to get you the right person, but it's also going to get you potentially, you know, like if they're going to see that they're going to be able to have a big impact. Mm. I mean, I, I certainly want to go into roles where I'm going to be able to change things, going to be able to do things, going to have, be able to have an impact. So that's a selling point for me. Yeah. So I, I don't think that, one, we shouldn't be hiding some candidates because we shouldn't. Yeah. But two, it's a selling factor. Mm. Okay. Uh, Adam, what's your point of view on what hiring managers can do to... Uh, create a better candidate experience interview process for top talent. <coughs> I, I was thinking, yeah, like talking through the challenges and almost trying, sometimes almost trying to scare candidates off the role mm. because if they, if, if they're then still like, oh yeah, like I'm interested in it, hopefully you're then going to get quite a motivated person sure. um, yeah. coming in into the role really. Um, so I think, yeah, we always, yeah, it's always just a bit, uh, 
just talk through the challenges. Like there's there's no because yeah, like you say, the amount of people that you, that maybe come in or you speak to, then you're like, oh, you're applying for a job and you've only been with your current company three months. So why, why is that? Well, I was the job I'm doing is completely different to the one I was sold in the interview. So I think yeah, definitely just be upfront and honest with what the job is. Um, and I think. Um, I say, obviously, when it comes to their questions, be as be as open and honest as possible. Um, it, it is always a good thing, and and, and then just again selling it, and, and more so um, selling the team that they may that they might be working in. What you, what you guys do as a, as a team together, um, talking through how often you might have to come. If it's a hybrid role, how often you would expect to be in the office, and almost sometimes set those expectations um, yeah, from yeah. the start, really. Um, and as well, I, I always try to encourage my hiring managers just to be as relaxed as possible because. No matter who you are, I mean, no one goes into an interview not nervous or to or anxious to a certain extent. You're always, especially now, I find, um, um, if even when I've done an interview, um, sort of externally, um, and Metro Bank know about it, um, I, um, you, you sat there just waiting for on a Zoom call, and it's just a bit like you're sort of waiting for the camera to turn on, like hello. <laughs> um, whereas previously, you would you would walk into an office, you would yeah, see someone yeah. at reception, you would you would shake someone's hand and have a bit of a bit of patter before you then actually go into the room and start the interview um so i always try to encourage my hiring managers to just when that interview starts just have a bit of a chat with them at the start because you i think you we now miss that I, I, well 95 percent of the interviews that metro bank do in, in tech anyway will always be virtual now sure. yeah. um and just have a have a chat with someone beforehand and, and try and hopefully settle them down because i think that's when you're then going to get more of the the real person that yeah. you're interviewing, you you put them at ease, um, and hopefully they you they're going to give you better answers. I can't remember who who told me this, but somebody said like the key to doing a good interview is to um, treat it like you're cooking in an oven and not a microwave. Because if you're if you're just trying to get in there and get the answers, and and it's just gonna it's gonna look good when it comes out, but but it's gonna be all you know. <laughs> like not very appealing to eat, right? I, if you cook it in another, it's gonna be a lot nicer. I, I, it's a weird analogy. That's but a great analogy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I also remember an example of I, when I was working in a recruitment agency and I interviewed someone um, who was going to come and work for us. Sure. Walked in the room and she was like bright red, and okay. you could see like she was so nervous. And you spend sort of five minutes at the start having a bit of a chat, and you could literally <laughs> almost see the colour just sort of like the red just drain and, and just coming back to normal you like almost just all the way down my neck and it was just like you could just when then see someone's becoming a lot more at ease yeah. and like i said yeah the the start of the interview wasn't great but to what as, as it progressed it just got so much better um so yeah definitely try and just spend a bit of time and okay chat. i think um Stephen might be able to ask this actually answer this is um some of the engineers that i've worked with historically say that when they're doing like a technical interview, for example, take that they actually have an expectation that candidates like level of ability actually drops by like 10% um, because of the pressure that they might be put under. Mm. Is that something you take into account when you um, interview? I engines? think the sad truth is not enough people take that into account. Yeah. That is the yeah. sad truth. Um, uh, I'll start by saying both of you guys hit the nail on the head completely. Like so many quality points. Like I, I I'm not even sure what I can add to them because <laughs> you, you guys have hit the nail on the head. Podcast yeah. over. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I, I just want to say, like, hiring managers and companies hiring, I believe, also need to have a lot of humility in this situation, right? Because I, I think it, it can be too easy, especially when you're in a company that's in high demand or you're like the only company hiring in the middle of a recession or something. It can be too easy to just be a bit like. Um, short with candidates and not not give them that personal touch. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, especially in tech interviews, there needs to be a lot of training for those engineers who are conducting those interviews to understand that that person is nervous in that moment and there's some things they may just may not get right or might take a bit more conversation. Or again, I was saying earlier about like a company might value certain um, certain traits. So like I I once had two interviews. Uh, in parallel with two different companies. Mm -hmm. um, I failed one tech test and I passed the other. Well, I, I didn't fail it. Like they, they used some feedback at the very end of the process. And what it turned out is one company actually um, really valued uh, collaboration. Like, so they wanted you to be asking questions as your first thing that you did. And then, uh, and, and then like giving your ideas based on the questions that you asked. Whereas the other one uh, valued independence and neither had specified this. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, companies need to be 
like like setting setting that expectation of what you're looking for with a candidate it forces you to be honest with what you're looking for it forces you to then train your engineers who will conduct the interviews on what they need to look for i think you're right you also need to tell like people need to understand these are human beings coming in you know <laughs> and some people get nervous some people english is not their first language so it takes them a little while to understand you need to consider neurodivergence like some people need time to think or yeah. whatever it is i i have a tendency to stare out the window when i'm thinking and some people see that as being a bit cold or whatever um all all of these things that training needs to happen you you're absolutely right and some companies are really good at doing it uh some are not um i want to shout out a previous company i worked at called bloom and wild like uh what one of their five values that they had was flower was, company yeah that's yeah. the one yeah uh it was called care um and we inject care into everything we do and that went from customer services all the way to the tech team and and it it really forced the tech team to think about like at the start as you said at the start of the interview like candidates logs onto the zoom call yeah. having like yeah. just like changed their baby's diaper or something yeah. <laughs> you know or, or whatever and and so uh uh we were encouraged to spend like the first 5 minutes being the candidates just be like look we're all working from home your amazon guy might turn up and ring yeah. the doorbell yeah. it's all fine don't worry about it or your kid might run in it's fine don't worry about it and yeah. you know bring, just just help them um be at ease um i've rambled a little, little bit based from uh, from, <laughs> no, from your first question but um it's it's, it's useful info though i i, I yeah. agree with what you're saying i i i think you're very right uh companies uh un- don't they don't always prep their own uh interviewers on like what to expect and all of this yeah. and and this actually represents wastage in a company right because when you do an interview that interview is like for a tech test it could be an hour and a half could be 2 hours you got to do maybe like half an hour prep you ideally want to do i set aside at least half an hour to like go through the cv if there's a tech test you might want another half hour to read through that code then you need to set aside half an hour at the end of that to um to do a debrief uh um an internal person from the account team has spent like 10 15 minutes set, send this also like so much time has been spent in your company and if that interview is unsuccessful because your own engineers didn't allow for something that is a natural human trait then that represents yeah. wastage at your company yeah. so that's something yeah. for hiring as you find that to consider tech test why funny as well cuz obviously yeah, we we now stay just don't really get involved with them some of the hiring might if we're going to do it we do it as part of one of the two stage interviews that we have um and it's usually just a drop in a question into the team's chat and getting them to work through it like that mm-hmm. um but again it's realistic who works under that pressure no, like it, really no one's getting it, right you've got 10 minutes to answer this question it's like well i mean a lot of the time i'm co- developers are probably just a lot of if they get stuck uh, well i'll google it uh, a, a lot of the time it, yeah. uh, who doesn't google a problem these days mm. um so yeah i i we always try and and stay away from them and if we're going to do it we do it as part of the the two stage interview process and we don't have like an hour long tech test cuz sure it's not really it's, it's more for us i think it's generally more about the theory behind things rather than yeah. the actual coding cuz i the amount of people we interview that can code but don't know why or what why they're doing it or why it, okay. what they're typing is doing it that makes sense it's yeah. more yeah. so and and so some companies blue and wild did this we offered the candidate two options you can either have uh, the the on zoom tech test where yeah. you're writing the code in that moment or you can do the homework tech test yeah. Yeah. and that allows again for neurodivergence or people who just don't have time yeah. like <coughs> you know when you got kids like your evenings are gone like, you yeah, know yeah, yeah, yeah. um so uh it it's it's good to offer those options yeah. to candidates cuz different people perform different and you're absolutely right like i i look up google and i look up chat chat <laughs> chat gpt, GPT now yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. 15 times yeah. a day you know? I, i started switching to bard uh, just cuz it's integrated <coughs> into google and it wasn't that good at first but it's now like instantly updated with gpt it's you know it's like a few months ago and with bard it's like oh, real time right. so it's really cool but i'm starting to see more and more companies um allow devs to use ai tools when um doing uh, technical yeah. because they're going to do it in the job i mean totally. like i mean and uh, instead of just going on stack overflow like secretly on a different tab i mean just like <laughs> they're going to be doing that in the role so i mean that's what you yeah. do you know as, as a hiring leader and um, i think something that you, that you mentioned a second ago was really useful about uh, i think it was bloom and wild one of their values was, was care and they, and they told you this before the um the the process and um, I, i remember metro doing this really well actually um this was a couple of years ago but i i had hired like a uh, a lead a chapter lead developer for, for you at some point and i think before the interview um i was sent a uh, a pack on um 
your core values, values yeah. it's like a maze or yeah, a press a maze, or something. A maze, yeah. And there was a book in there written by one of your founders or, or directors or um, something. Yeah. And um, I, you know, less than one percent of people will, will read that book. But my candidate read the book uh, before the interview, and oh. they referenced many points during the interview on how that connects their core values and things that they've done. Obviously, they got the job because they were <laughs> to go there. I, even I was amazed. I was like, "You read the book? Like, really? <laughs> like, 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 wow. Um, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. You yeah. know. Um, so." T- telling people what the values are before they start the company because most people will tell them the values after they've got the job and and then it's like values are the sort of thing that often get written on a wall and people look at once a year and they forget about but the the, the companies that do the best when it comes to hiring the companies that do the best when it comes to growing and, and succeeding are the ones that you know they actually live those values day to day and it's not just having the word ambitious written on a plaque somewhere it's um you know in the cafeteria it's it's about when you're doing your one-to-ones when you're doing your team meetings yeah. when you're doing wrap-ups it's like all right okay look we, you know we as a company we have a mission to, to be curious what what have we each done this week that, that you know that demonstrates that, that that value? And sometimes that's that's a little bit um, fake doing it that way, but um, just integrating it into like the DNA of the of the business mm. is like well, what I'm trying to say. And then like you have your annual performance review process, where if it is if it is a good process, like you will actually be gauged against how you demonstrated those values, mm. right? So yeah. that it's yeah. going to come around eventually. Yeah. Um, so uh, and and so it's it's worth a candidate knowing that it's like eventually at some point, uh, like. And and one of the best examples I can think of is a, a long time ago, like the, there was this project and we were all just pushed to work like crazy hours and all of this. And, you know, the feedback I gave on on, on, on the manager that was like, okay, yeah, sure, we, we delivered and the company made cash, but like none of the values were met. Yeah. <laughs> it was actually terrible. Like it's so aggressive, you know, and, and, um, and this is going to be an attrition risk because people are not going to put up with this. Like, yeah. this is not why we joined. This is not how I'm being engaged in my performance review. So why am I being treated this way? So yeah, it's, it's something worth bearing in mind. Like those values you can usually like you as a candidate can like, if you browse the career site or, um, or even the, the company's website, career section or whatever, uh, it's usually documented somewhere. And so it's, always worth having a quick look at that and then tailoring your answers to show how you demonstrate those values because your hiring manager will eventually gauge you on those Mm -hmm. values once a year yeah and it's better to do it before (coughs) they start rather than uh you know um a year into the job yeah Yeah. and and you might decide those values aren't for you yeah Mm -hmm. exactly that's also a thing yeah yeah i found that okay cool well hopefully people um listening got really good value out of that both as candidates looking for jobs and hiring managers looking to grow and scale their their teams and businesses and um, for people that have made it to the end i suppose specifically candidates if they're um looking for jobs right now um just quickly from each of you how do they best get in touch is it linkedin have you got a careers page um you know what what, what types of technical roles do, do, do you tend to hire for as well so the people listening can can approach you for the right opportunities um start with yourself first uh yeah so multiverse has a careers page uh yeah. that that'd be the best place to start. i will say that we've slowed down our hiring recently because we've done some massive growth and we kind of need to oh, you're going from a lot of that in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh our tech team hiring is going to be slow for like the next uh, three to six months but after that it'll be uh junior mid and senior engineers what, what type what type of tech stack do you work with Primarily a language called Elixir, which not many people have experience in. So we do actually make provision for learning Elixir once you've joined the company. Yeah. Um, uh, so so language spe- specifics aren't necessary. Uh, yeah. But uh, again, growing companies. So like if you were to apply to Multiverse, like can you bring in examples of times that you experiment? Like we value innovation. Can you bring examples of times where you experimented with new technologies? Um uh, I can say this like we're, we're not mature with serverless, but we are experimenting sure, sure. with it. If you can demonstrate that you've got a lot of hands-on experience, you've deployed a bunch of stuff on that. Um, uh, th- these are some of the things we Okay, value. so, you know, Elixir is, is a primary and then microservices, Docker Kubernetes, it'll all be good bonuses and nice to have to, to bring to the table. Uh, I'd say Elixir is not a necessary to apply to the, the role okay. because we recognize like not many people out there have oh, that it's pretty experience. niche. Yeah, it's yeah. Pretty I've, niche, yeah. I've worked a few um, Elixir roles before and I've mentioned it to candidates and they're like, you mean the, the voice chat? Thing Alexa? Like, no, 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 not not Alexa. Alexa. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, Craig, how do people work in the wonderful world of web free blockchain? How are they how are they getting in touch and applying for jobs? With you? Yeah, so we do have a careers page. You can find it on the Truly Tech website. Um, we are hiring at the moment for a number of engineers, uh, predominantly for our core blockchain team, and. Uh, I'm going to get even more niche with language now. Okay, um, like Solidity and stuff? Or? No, we build in OCaml. 
on the back end. Okay, and, that's very niche. And we do build in Rust as well, which is becoming okay. quite yeah, prominent now. Yeah. Um, so we don't expect people to have Rust or OCaml experience, uh, a passion to learn new language um, and learn new technology. And we are very functional in what we do. So a lot of it's low level, uh, deep tech, yeah. um, computer science fundamentals. Yeah. So while we don't need that kind of it, well, we don't need functional program experience, but we do need people who have uh, a passion and interest in you know, solving very complex deep tech problems yeah. um, on the mix of coding, but also kind of like mathematics sure, um, because sure. of what we're doing. Um, we do have a, other roles, so we're hiring for a DevOps engineer at the moment. We're hiring in our developer success area as well, so helping to kind of grow the developer ecosystem in, yep. in the blockchain world. So, you know, doing things like workshops, uh, content, uh, tech, technical documentation, engaging the communities. So a little bit more of like a an outward-facing technical role. Yeah. So um, take a look at our website and okay, uh, cool. there's plenty of vacancies on there. Awesome. And um, Adam, obviously Metro is massive, um, <laughs> always always hiring, always looking for people. But um, what is there anything that comes to mind at the moment or um, and then I suppose tech stack for developers? I mean, it's um, probably a mixture, right? But yeah. So obviously we've got two parts of the business, really. We've got the core Metro business, um, which is like sort of a very Java heavy stack. Um, and obviously on the, the dev, obviously we've got the DevOps team, um, Kubernetes, Docker, like all, all those sort of techs that you mentioned. And then we've got the consumer finance part of the business, um, which is more sort of C-sharp, .NET um, kind of things as well. Um, always, I suppose, we always have, have a bit of trouble whenever the roles come around, sort of like Angular, um, the, the, those sorts of, uh, of roles, they're quite, quite popular. Um, something I'm desperate for at the moment is um, authentication, so like Forge Rock. Um, so if anyone out there is looking for a Forge Rock job, a permanent one, that and, you, and you want to get out of contracting <laughs> and come and work in a, a perm job at Metro Bank, then let me know. Um, but yeah, again, that's yeah, sort of the very, very niche, very niche tech, to be honest. But, um, but yeah, um, yeah, in terms of finding us, Metro Bank website, LinkedIn, obviously, yeah, drop me a, a message or a request on LinkedIn. Cool. Um, oftentimes, <coughs> um, the names of, of you all will be in the episode, so feel free to search people on LinkedIn and um, there'll be links to, to what you're posting and everything on, on there as well. Cool. All right. Thank you for listening. Hopefully you got some value out of the episode and I'll see you all next week. Thank you. Hey, thanks for watching this podcast. Make sure that you like, subscribe, follow, comment, etc., etc. And I'll see you in the next episode.